Започнуваме со интервјуто кој што го нарековме клучно интервју. Ке ме извините, јас на момент ке се префрлам на англиски јазик, за да биде полесна комуникацијата, меѓутоа брзо ке се исклучам и тие самите ке, ке продолжат. So I have the pleasure to introduce the keynote interview and speaker. Uh, so Mike Zafirovski and Marcello Klore. Welcome. Hello. Um, hi. Hi. Good afternoon. Dobar den. Dobar den, Mike. So it will be quite difficult for me to introduce Marcello, uh, but I would read how world media outlets introduce him. They say he is a billionaire, businessman, Bolivian-American technology entrepreneur and investor. However, I'm glad that today we will have a chance to personally meet you, Marcelo. Uh, I'm pretty sure you all know Mike, uh, but let me share one internal statistics about Mike. So he is the sole board member who never missed a summit and never missed a single session of the summit. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so why, uh, why actually Mike is doing interview with uh, Marcelo? I would say that they share uh, many common things. Uh, one of them is, I have to say this, they're both successful. Both are with roots from a developing country. Uh, both are great leaders, men with great hearts, and certainly lovers of sports. So Marcelo and Mike, thank you for joining us today. Apologies for being a bit late. We are really honored to, to have you. And now I give the floor to Mike, actually. But I would start with the first question, which is, can you please tell us how you've met? Can you share well, that? First of all, first of all, Nick, it's a благодарам на сите. I really wish I was there in person. But it's such a pleasure to see you again, Marcelo. Um, and when I think of entrepreneurs and great executives, determination and perseverance is probably quality number one when I look for a, in a person. So I think f follows your uh, question, Nick, it's a, maybe you can tell, tell us the story how we actually not only met, but our jog, our run in Mexico City about 20 years ago. And I think that's gonna give people some sense of the mm -hmm. perseverance that, that, that you have, Marcel. But again, great to see you, it's, it's always you. such a pleasure. Thank you, Mike Safirovsky. And uh, you know, when Mike asked me uh, to basically do this interview, you know, I could never say no to Mike because uh, <laughs> He's, he's been a great friend, a great mentor, and, a, and somebody who's been a, a tremendous influence in my life. And it, when I started reading about Macedonia, as a country, North Macedonia, you know, it's amazing the similarities to where I'm from. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. from I'm from Bolivia, which is a small country in the middle of South America, surrounded by a lot of powerful, <laughs> a lot more powerful countries. So I would say we share the similarity of where we came from. And I always tell people that you know, probably Mike and myself were a mistake. Like, we, we are not supposed to be where we are. We are, we are not supposed to have the experiences that we have had because it's rarely that you have a North Macedonian who's gone outside of, of his comfort zone and has led, you know, some of the most iconic companies or been part of the most iconic companies in the world and, uh, and has been, a, I would say, one of the great leaders of mobile technology that has pretty much revolutionized our life. So for that... Uh, it's good, and a Bolivian is definitely not supposed to be leading one of the largest uh, investment companies in the world. So, so we're, we're a mistake, <laughs> and, and hopefully that mistake will serve to be an inspiration, you know, to a lot of people in my home country in Bolivia and to a lot of people in North Macedonia. So I'm an entrepreneur at heart. You know, I, uh, I've been an entrepreneur since I was very young, and one of the first business I had was a company called Brightstar, and Brightstar became as a distributor of mobile phones. That's how we got started and a distributor that caused a lot of trouble because we were not authorized to sell mobile phones by anybody. So we found pricing inefficiencies all over the world from large manufacturers, and we found that in that case, Motorola used to sell phones at a different price in Canada or in China or in Europe, different prices. So we just basically bought phones and sold them all over the world. And we became very large that we caught the eye of Motorola, and then Motorola, which Mike was the leader there, starting allowing us to buy phones and I started to resell them. And I really wanted to get to Mike one way or another because he was the big boss of Motorola and, uh, and nobody let me get to Mike. Uh, and, you know, Mike was the big boss and the maximum I could get was, I think, to the, one of the salespeople of Motorola in Latin America. But Motorola made the mistake of inviting me, I remember, to a Formula 
two race or three, because yep. back then there wasn't Formula One in Mexico City. Uh, and I got to see Mike from very far away. So as a good entrepreneur, you know, just approach, uh, approach uh, Mike and ask him, uh, you know, if, what was he doing? And I had heard that he was a runner. And I asked Mike uh, if he wanted to run with me in Mexico City. And, you know, I'm, I wasn't a runner. I could hardly <laughs> run. But Mike, uh, Mike agreed to run uh, with me in Mexico City. And six Mexico o'clock City, in the morning, right? Six o'clock in the morning. Mexico City is very high. In like 2,000 meters or 2,500 meters above sea level. And I had an opportunity to run with Mike. I was not a runner. Mike was a very fast runner. And I kept up with, with Mike. We even left a bodyguard who couldn't follow. <laughs> And uh, I remember we ran for exactly 46 minutes because Mike was 46 years old back then. <laughs> and I think I caused a good, uh, we, we built a friendship. We got to know each other and that allowed me to know Mike and Mike took a huge bet on me. I remember that, you know, Brightstar had very little money, but Mike was very kind to approve a line of credit of $300 million. <clears throat> and because of that, you know, Brightstar grew to be one of the largest Brighter up to today because it's still the largest Hispanic company ever founded in the United States, and more importantly, became the largest distribution company and supply chain services in the entire world. So it was you know, people like Mike <laughs> that took a leap of faith in me, that believed in what I wanted to build. And at the end, you can say that he risked his job because if, if I would not have paid Motorola those $300 million <laughs> back, Mike would have been in trouble. And we actually did that. And I always say that you know, life is full of these moments that we all face, this, this life-changing moment, and we are ta- we're going to take an advantage of those. And Mike was the one who gave me that opportunity. I took advantage of it, and that was probably one of the biggest stepping stones in my life to determine of who I am today. So that's why I'm, I'm forever grateful to Mike for having taken a chance with me. Well, Marcel, I know you le- love to mentor people as well, but as a human being, there's actually nothing more personally rewarding than to see that you can make um, influence on others. So thank you very much for that. And maybe just a comment to the people, all, all the people, what are uh, corporate executives, entrepreneurs, maybe just an additional element to Marcelo's story was in that 46 minute run, I mean, he had his sales pitch ready. I mean, he knew exactly what the ask was going to be. He was visualizing it. So many times in your life, people may even call it elevator speech, but if you really can visualize you really want something, and if you come in front of the opportunity, can you succinctly summarize that? And Marcelo's whole life in terms of both from Bright Star, but all the activities afterwards, I think it's a perfect example for you to be able to, be able to visualize, but then also to have the drive and uh, perseverance to make the ask simple and compelling to the other side. So anyway, just uh, yeah, no, as that, I was reflecting on that, that. That's true. I mean, my mission when we went running <laughs> was one that I didn't fall apart while I was running <laughs> because that was a high risk. But I wanted Mike to understand that I could help him gain a significant amount of market share if he allowed me to be his exclusive distributor in Latin America. It's a very bold ask. Yep. But it, it was compelling because uh, Mike needed to sell more Motorola phones. <laughs> so it was a good bet. And, that, and that's what allows to do that. And, and, you know, in my life today, in today's job, that's what I do. I listen to entrepreneurs, eight, ten entrepreneurs a day, and then we make investment decisions. And it is those that have a very clear vision of what they want to accomplish and how they're going to accomplish that we make bets. Mm-hmm. And at the end, in the investment world, or pretty much in, in all of our lives, right, we make bets on people, whether we're going to promote them, whether we're going to invest in them based on their ability to visualize, yeah. you know, what their plan is. Marcel, I know uh, Macedonia and Bolivia are similar economic development uh, opportunities and challenges. Although you guys are quote unquote huge, at 11.7 million, I think you're six times the size of Macedonia, but still similar challenges. How do you view digitization opportunities? Is that a opportunity? if you will, or is that an unnecessary burden at this, at this point of time in the development, in the businesses in those two countries? Yeah. So I, I think, you know, we at SoftBank, you know, we look at life a little bit different. We look at, there are different revolutions that happen in life. Mm-hmm. And every time there's a revolution, there's a new opportunity that comes to everybody. You know, we go back to the in, in agricultural revolution or the industrial revolution, 
and you and I were very lucky to be part of the mobile revolution, <laughs> where we actually, when, whenever you put a mobile phone in the hands of a consumer, amazing things started to happen, productivity went up, there's just some great things that happened. After that, we started to live the internet revolution, mm -hmm. which was powered by the mobile phones. The fact that we all have a, a computer in our hand, I think the penetration in Macedonia is close to 80%, so pretty much everybody yeah. has a mobile phone. <clears throat> we become much more efficient and so we can do a lot more things. And today we live, what we, we, you know, we forecasted the, what we call the AI revolution, and that is the power of the internet basically exponentially grows the moment you have AI. Why? Mm -hmm. Because you know, there's more memory, there's more processing power, so a machine becomes more and more smarter. <clears throat> and right now we're in the middle of the AI revolution that because of the pandemic, it got massively, massively accelerated. And the message that I want to leave here is it was the last five, 10 years, it was very hard to do massive innovation and disruption because only two things got disrupted. Advertising, you have the rise of Google, the rise of Facebook, mm -hmm. who basically destroyed your traditional yep, advertisers. Yep. And secondly was e-commerce, companies like Alibaba, companies like Amazon, that basically disrupted uh, retail. Yeah. But that's it. Everything else stayed the same. The way, we, the way we got educated stayed the same. The way we got treated for diseases stayed the same. The way we got transported stayed the same. And because of the AI revolution, we believe that in the next five years, every single thing is going to be disrupted. The way we work is totally disrupted. You know, we've seen it through, what are we doing today? It was unheard <laughs> of, of talking to, <laughs> yeah. from New York to Macedonia, you and I sitting here, yeah. right? And the way we communicate with people, you know, that massively changed. The way we buy stuff massively changed. I mean, today, my, you know, nobody cooks in my house. Everybody orders utilizing <laughs> Uber Eats or utilizing DoorDash. Soon, the way we move is going to be via autonomous vehicles. The way we educate our kids is going to be more intelligent in a way that you can, you can have an individual, a specialized education based on what your strengths and your weakness are. The way we treat diseases is going to be utilizing intelligence, not seeing a doctor that sort of looks at you and says, hey, this is the way to <laughs> fix you, but actually utilizing data, utilizing genomics, utilizing artificial intelligence. And these are just examples of how the world is going to massively, massively mm -hmm. change. There's not one thing that we do today that is not going to be different in the next five years. So that is very important because that opens incredible amount of opportunities. We at SoftBank invest in six or seven companies a week. We invest $1 billion a week into all these entrepreneurs from all over the world that are basically bringing innovative and disruptive business models. And the, the entrepreneurs are so capable of identifying inefficiencies that they're able to utilize technology to fix those inefficiencies. So I look at the fact that this is just the beginning, it's minute one of a 90 minute match in football of disruption, innovation, mm. the way we change, it just opens opportunities for entrepreneurs that in the past you had to be in Silicon Valley to be an entrepreneur. And today the world is so large and we're so connected that it really doesn't matter where you are. So the challenge that I set up for Bolivia was I want to see a unicorn. A unicorn is a company is worth more than a billion dollars. And I'm amazed, you know, just in Latin America alone, just to keep it close, you know, I've invested in unicorns in Ecuador, which is a small market, in Chile, in Argentina, in Colombia, in Mexico, in Brazil. Uh, and, you know, my dream is to basically see a unicorn in Bolivia. And the same thing needs to happen in North Macedonia, you know, is to go find those entrepreneurs that are willing to utilize technology because in the internet world, there are no barriers, there's no frontiers, there's no borders. You know, you're basically allowed to run a company all over the world, sitting in your desk, wherever you are. So I think that this new AI revolution that we're living, which is the AI of disruption, mm -hmm. is going to be the most exciting times in the history of mankind. I think the next 10 years, there's going to be more change than the last 200 years. So it opens an incredible potential of opportunities for entrepreneurs who want to disrupt the way we work, the way we live, and the way we play. And what comes first? Is it the ideas or the funding? I mean, quite often you hear the need for venture capital or bank financing. Obviously, you're fixing that directly, if you will, for parts of South America. But sometimes I'm just curious to, to get you a sense of the ideas. They are coming from the developing world relative to what you may see in the U.S. Yeah. So 
this is something that I've tested, right? You know, in, in my job as being the CEO of SoftBank, I lived in Tokyo mm -hmm. when we started deploying Vision Fund 1. And Vision Fund 1 was the largest, it was a 100 billion, billion uh, technology fund that our goal was to disrupt venture capital. <laughs> and it bothered me that all I saw were Chinese entrepreneurs, Indian entrepreneurs, and American entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Very little European and very little Latin American entrepreneurs. So I took a plane, I went to Latin America, and I realized that the quality of entrepreneurs were there, you know, but they were lacking ambition. They were lacking ambition because there was no capital, because they were scared. They were running a business, you know, at a very low RPM or with a break always on because they say, what happens if we build this business and we run out of money, we're going to go bankrupt. So I launched a $5 billion Latin American fund, and I'm amazed. I'm blown away. When I went to Latin America in 2019, the total amount of venture investing was 1.5 billion. Today, two years later, the total amount of venture investing is 28 billion. It's like wow. 14 times. And the quality of entrepreneurs were there. The problem was there was no capital. And there was something wrong because Latin America is only half the size of China, and China had $100 billion of, of venture investing. So it was the lack of capital. And I think that applies a lot you know, to, to smaller markets like North Macedonia, where I have no doubt that there's an incredible set of talented entrepreneurs, but the problem is the venture world is not there. So I think it's, it's a combination of those. Mm. Now, the, the beautiful thing is there has never been more venture money today in the yeah. world. <laughs> so if there's great ideas and there are great entrepreneurs, you know, there's always capital to help fund those ideas. Thank you for that. And also, I mean, as we're preparing for this, you told me about your brother, Maybe just a, a short summary of his business, obviously working with you, then going on his own, taking a small idea, and all of a sudden that's, I mean, again, a very practical example of what's yeah. possible yeah, in that, a that, short time. That, that is a very, that, that's a very good example. So I have a younger brother who figured out that the world needed an internet vocational school, meaning mm. you can learn the things that nobody teaches you how to be a chef, how to be a better driver, how to operate a tractor trailer, how to be a plumber, how to do those sort of jobs that unfortunately in the United States, those jobs are filled by the Latino community. But you just show up and you learn on the go, so they were never <laughs> done. So he started a business from zero. He started a, offering those courses. First, he learned how to cook. And today he holds the largest internet-driven vocational school where he's graduating 70,000 students a month. Wow. So, and he's growing and growing. And he started as one guy with one computer. Out of Miami or Bolivia? Out of Bolivia. Well, now he's in Miami. Now he operates all over, the, all over Latin America, yeah. all over the United States. Now he has 500 people call centers wow. and, and all those things. Mm -hmm. But it shows that example. And I think the company is worth, you know, several hundreds of millions of dollars. But that shows that you don't need to. You know, you can be sitting in North Macedonia, come up with a great idea. Uh, and I, I will tell you one thing that I was studying North Macedonia a little, is you guys have something very positive. You have a very high internet penetration. Yep. You have a very high bank account. You know, 80% of people bank. You know, very little credit card penetration, but very high internet penetration, which means, you know, you have the basic things in order to be an entrepreneur. In many of these countries in Latin America, there's still connectivity is very low. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I think you have, you know, you have what it takes. I think what we need now is we need venture money and we need ambition. And if you have that, you know, there's no doubt why you cannot create these amazing entrepreneurs. I do think one <clears throat> very generic comment, but lots of the entrepreneurs in the developing world are very cautious or reluctant to give up equity in their companies. So you yeah. said, I mean, they own, own everything. They're very concerned about going bankrupt. At least what my advice has been, I'd love to get your take on it, is that 100% I mean, of very little is very little. Yeah. And but if you get the right venture capital partners, obviously that's a great way to help you grow the company. Do you have a perspective on that? Yeah. So our belief at SoftBank is entrepreneurs should be focused on building a great product that is solving a big problem, mm -hmm. learning how to take that product to market, but they should not never be worried about how they fund the business. And, you know, that's our job as venture capitalists. We like to call us up and vision capitalists. You know, we like people that come with a vision and we will fund them. 
And once you do that, it's a very powerful combination when you have a capital partner that will provide you with the necessary capital that you need to grow a business. And, you know, and the world is, I would say, the world is easier today. I mean, I remember when I was an entrepreneur, there was no venture capital. <laughs> I mean, you had to, you know, my venture capital was <laughs> Motorola. Not, not for distribution uh, companies anyway, uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, it was very hard. You had to go find banks. You had to go find people who believed in you. You had to go to your friends and family and all that. Today, the world is relatively easy. You know, if you have a great idea, if you prove that you can execute, there's excess amount of capital. You know, whenever a great entrepreneur shows up that has a great idea and a great company, today we fight. The entrepreneur gets to decide, mm -hmm. who do I want to take money from? And obviously, we, everybody has a different competitive advantage, but the world has changed. And the world is thirsty and hungry, the venture capital world, for great entrepreneurs to have an ability. So, you know, to those in the audience that are entrepreneurs that have that desire to build a business, I would say there has never been a better time in the history of the world to be an entrepreneur because there's capital and there's everything open for disruption. Imagine, I mean, you know, you can just show up and with the help of technology, there are so many problems that you can solve with technology and that's what the world is, you know, that's what the world is looking for. You know, you probably get 1,500 Email us for ideas to, uh, to SoftBank after this interview. Good. <laughs> it's easy. <coughs> Marcelo at SoftBank.com. Uh, we're always looking for great ideas. Uh, and by the way, we're calling from the headquarters of WeWork downtown uh, New York. We do have a Macedonia 2025 coffee mugs. We do. And as we were preparing for this, Marcelo, we did not specify which date, but Marcelo did make the commitment to come and visit us in uh, Skopje, hopefully in the not too distant future. No, I'd I, I love to. I mean, one, one of the most exciting things for my job is to get to travel around the world. <laughs> and today, you know, today, I would say, last I look, we're in over 100 countries with SoftBank, and our companies transact with 3.5 billion people every single day. Wow. And I take a lot of pride of saying that I've been to most countries in the world, and Macedonia is not one of those, so Good. I will definitely, I was lucky to go to Gibraltar a few weeks back okay. to launch our crypto bank, but, uh, you know, Macedonia is definitely <clears throat> one of the countries that uh, is not a, uh, that I haven't visited, and there's nothing more exciting in the world than landing to a place that you've never awesome. been to. It's yeah. A, yeah. I'll ask you about crypto after this next question, but obviously you're executive chairman for WeWork. And with the pandemic and technology, the future of work is changing rapidly. I mean, you know, CEOs cannot even determine what is the best way with a remote wor uh, work uh, hybrid. Love to get your perspectives, obviously, both as an executive in general, but also as a chairman of uh, WeWork. Yeah. Any thoughts and perspectives of, quote unquote, what is the future of work? Yeah. So WeWork has been probably one of the most fun turnarounds I've had a chance to do. And that is a perfect example where in the world is 10% ideas, 90% execution. Yep. <clears throat> WeWork was founded by an Israeli, Adam Newman, who had an incredible vision. And that is, if, you want, if you're a businessman and you're starting a business or you're a small mm -hmm. business and you want to open your first office, think about it. You go to one of these landlords, they ask you for a 10 to 15 year lease they ask you for a letter of credit to guarantee the rent. You gotta go hire an architect. You gotta go hire a builder and you gotta build your space and you have no idea how big you're gonna be. <laughs> so in many cases, you're paying rent for bigger space than what you need. Uh, and it's painful because when you start a business, you have no idea how big you're gonna be. You have no idea in how many countries you're gonna be in this global world. And then secondly, work is a lonely place, right? You, you, if you have your own office, you interact with five, six people. So Adam came up with the idea is we need a community. We need a place where all the small and medium business will have their office. They pay one monthly rent. They don't need to worry about building. It's all built out. It's beautiful. And then in the center of it, there's a community. And a community means people at 5, 6 o'clock, people leave their office. They all come. They all talk. They all brainstorm. They all, they all help each other. So that was the initial idea. An entrepreneur with a great idea with no capital. So he came to SoftBank, and we loved the idea. So we actually invested $10 billion, and we told Adam, grow your idea. So against all odds, we were open 1,000 buildings in two years, right? Wow. 
put things in perspective, it took Marriott 125 years to open 800 buildings. So this was done in two years. Mm -hmm. I think Adam's strength was vision. In the execution, he got a little distracted, and that's when I had to come in. And we have basically fixed WeWork. WeWork now is a public company. WeWork is going to be profitable next year. But now we run a very tight company. And we got very lucky in the pandemic because the pandemic changed the way we work forever. You know, people realized that they could do a lot of the same job they used to do in the office. They can do it at home. But they also have a need to come to the office to do conference calls, to just get out of home and all that. So the new trend of work is what is called a flexible workspace. It's mm -hmm. a hybrid work where half of it is done at home, half of them is done at work. And I think that has happened is a distributor force. In the past, there was this concept that everybody had to work in an HQ, which is pretty, not necessarily <laughs> the smartest thing, because even though you work in an HQ, you just meet with your own little group every day. So employees are demanding, I say, we don't want to go, if we want to work for Facebook or Google, we don't want to go to San Francisco. We can basically do our job from mm -hmm. anywhere where we are. So now you have all these companies who the role of the, H the HQ is totally gone forever. And what has happened is there's the employers are basically putting offices in proximity to where their employees are. So the world has changed. It used to be an employer world. Today it's an employee world. So the employee decides which company they're going to go work for based on many things. Mm -hmm. One of them is location. So suddenly we work now it's experiencing an incredible growth or buildings are starting to get full and the whole concept of a flexible workspace where it's no longer five days, maybe it's three or four days. It's no longer headquarter. Maybe it's an office close to where I am. It's no longer, you know, I have to be in the office, you know, all the time. I can work from home, mm -hmm. but if I want to meet with my team, I can go to not an office, to a collaboration center that sits. Today we have the world's leading companies renting a whole floor at WeWork and they say this is our collaboration center. So if I have 500 employees in Brooklyn, I only need a place for 100 people where people are going to come and collaborate. So very different the way work is coming back. Some companies have gone 100% remote, 100%. Some companies have gone 50% remote, 50% come to the office. So I think we're living, in, the pandemic was long enough that it, it allowed us mm -hmm. to teach ourselves that we really don't need to be in an office 100% of the time to be efficient. So a lot of exciting times, like I said, these five years, everything is going to change. And for sure, the way we work is definitely going to change. Well, I love the way you articulate uh, the business opportunities and the solutions on so many topics, including, um, including workspace in the future of WeWork. Um, very different, you tweeted recently, the more I understand about crypto, the more I like it. Lots of potential everywhere. Um, can you tell us more about this? And yeah. also possibilities for small countries like Macedonia or Bolivia yeah. To, yeah. to play a role in that revolution, if you will? Yeah. So after the air revolutions, it is my personal opinion that the next revolution is what is called the blockchain revolution. Mm -hmm. And the best way to think about it is the internet allows for the transfer of information. It doesn't matter if you're in Macedonia or you're sitting in New York City. Whenever we're looking at the information that's available to the, inter in the internet, it's a democratic information. We all have access to the same information. Mm -hmm. It is probably one of the less discriminatory forms of existing because it doesn't matter how rich you are, how poor you are, where you're from, the, the information is there available for all of us. And that's what the internet allowed us is the transfer of information. What blockchain does it allows for the transfer of value. And that's a whole different, it opens what I like to call it decentralized finance. An opportunity that we're seeing is, it is absurd. If I wanna send money today to somebody in Macedonia, there's probably five to 10 institutions yeah, that are gonna take a small little piece of somebody who's gonna provide FX, somebody's gonna provide clearing, somebody's gonna provide remittance services, and everybody takes a little piece. And the same thing happens, even if I need to send you money in the United States, there's six different people who are going to take a little piece of that. Makes no sense. Today, in the Bitcoin, crypto, blockchain, you know, with decentralized financing, the logic is I send you value, and it's I send it to you directly, and in the blockchain, it gets registered in a safe way. 
So therefore, mm -hmm. it eliminates the dis it, it eliminates the constant amount of institutions that have to touch value. So what and it's instant, it's immediate. I transfer you what transfer your value, Bitcoin, some sort of crypto, even fiat, utilizing blockchain, and the money is available immediately, and you get the exact same amount of money. It's logical if you think about it. So I can send so I can sell send something to Macedonia immediately. And in less than a second, they have the exact amount that I've sent it. Try sending a traditional bank transfer <laughs> no, to Macedonia no, today. No, no, I know. 24 no, hours no, if no, you get it, no. and at least 5% of the money had mysteriously disappeared. Yeah. So that is the, that is the, the beauty yeah. of what's going to happen with the blockchain world. And that's just one example. There's thousands of examples. And today I see that some of the most brilliant minds and brilliant entrepreneurs are basically putting all their energy in into this, what we like yeah. to call Web 3.0. Perfect example. Facebook, one of the most powerful companies in the world, changes its name to Meta. Yeah, it's the introduction true. to the Metaverse. Yeah. And that is all the innovation for the next 10 years are AI combined with blockchain. Well, Marcel, I can go on for another three hours, but I have a couple, per, two personal questions and then uh, maybe a closing question before. I'm sure Nick uh, yeah, has some questions some. from her side. But I love the way you involve your dad, your beautiful wife, Jordan, your kids in virtually everything you do. I don't follow Instagram except our, my kids and their grandkids, but you're the only person my three boys have said. You know, Matt, Kirk, and Todd says, you have to follow Marcelo. So it's, anytime you look, what are your, in Japan, Europe, Aspen, I mean, it is very rarely you're not with your family and with friends. And that seems quite unusual. Most busy executives have a hard time Connecting friends, family, and um, in the business, I'd love for you to make some comments yeah. on that. So, so, any ideas? Because lots yeah, of entrepreneurs so, so, work so seven by twenty-four. I'd like to say yeah. that first thing is they're all one of the same, right? And the only way you can do that is if you love what you do, right? And you know, when I, as we get older and we ex we have a lot more experience. I would say that the number one and most important thing, advice that I can give to anybody, doesn't matter if you're a government official, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a business person, if you are a stay-at-home mom, right? The only way you're going to be happy is if you love what you do. And if I'm lucky, you know, I, I'm yeah. passionate and I actually do love what I do every single second of my life. Yeah. So therefore, you're able to mix. To me, business, family, and friends are one of the same. I'll give you a, a, it's funny when you said that, this, that yeah. this, this brings to, to memory where I was thinking, what can I do? I have six kids, five, five girls and, and, and one boy. And I said, what can I do that's special for my young girls who we've all been in the same place in the pandemic? And finally, Europe opens up. So I take my, I take three of my young girls to Paris and I told my wife that I don't want her to come. I just want the father <laughs> and my three girls. Yeah, great and we, pictures. This and, we, and, we, and we're in Paris. And in the middle of that, I realized, hey, you know, maybe they got to go do some stuff on their own. So I was able to combine to meet 20, 30 entrepreneurs in the morning, <laughs> in the afternoon, I'm with my daughters. At night, I'm having dinner with my daughters and entrepreneurs. And at the end of that trip, I discovered that the French are great entrepreneurs. <laughs> so I ended up investing over a billion dollars in six companies in France. Well, while my girls had the best time of their life because that trip is always going to be a memorable one. And that's my life. My life is combining the love what I have for my family, my friends, and the love what I have for my work because I truly love what I do. So to me, it's one of the same. There's no difference. It, a day is a combination of friends, family, and business. Great. Quick thing about sports. I mean, we both love sports. We follow the sports. I think we went to the World Cup together, I think, in Korea yes. and Japan. Yeah, that's true. It was it 2002, I think, or thereabouts? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But obviously, you know, I see you're biking now. You, you ran the New York Marathon. Yes. So how yeah. does sports relate to your business and family activities? Any correlation yeah. there? L lots of it, right? So first is you were an inspiration. Max is an avid, uh, Mike is an avid runner, a uh, triathlon and all that. And I, you know, I always wanted to do a marathon, even though I'm a six foot six and, <laughs> and I weighed about 125 kilos. You know, I was probably the heaviest and tallest marathon runner. What, do you call I, 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 what is the name for those runners? I don't know. Clydesdales, I think. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, it, was, it was an incredible achievement for me to be able to prove to myself. And what I learned is that the, probably the most important medicine, the most important drug that we can ever take 
is exercise, right? Yeah. Because if you can run in the morning, bike in the morning, or do whatever exercise you do, you just feel so much better the rest of the day. Also, you know, sports is highly competitive. So I am lucky, you know, I own a, a t in the second division team in Spain, Girona. I own a team in Bolivia, Bolivar, the, the, my, my, my country. And I also used, used to own a major league soccer, which is yeah, the, the, in, the, right? the Inter Miami that I just sold. And that, that teaches how to be, you know, incredibly, incredibly competitive. And, you know, it, it, it's a dream to be able to assemble a team and see how they're going to play. And I will say, lastly, sports, the beauty, the most beautiful thing of sports, and especially sports that we all love, soccer or football, yep. <laughs> is that it doesn't matter how big you are or how small you are. Yep. My first job in 1993 was to be the international manager of the Bolivian Soccer Federation, and it was the only Were you time... Were years old? 23. And that was the only <laughs> time in the history of my country that we took Bolivia to the World Cup, and we got to open the World Cup in 1994. And that was the biggest lesson of my life was that taught me that absolutely everything is possible. It's possible for a Macedonian to be successful. It's possible for a Bolivian to be successful. And I've been following Macedonian soccer, you know, and I am, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm blown away, you know, how you guys beat Iceland. And With how, the Germany and Germany too. And Germany, you know, and, uh, you know, and you almost, you know, you're almost there, right? Yes. The fact that you're going to go a playoff and the fact that, you know, it shows that it doesn't matter how big you are. You know, how could a country of two million people yeah. be able to fight a country of Germany that has tens of millions of people, and that's all they think about Germans? Yeah. So that is the beauty of sports. You know, yeah. you can you can achieve in, in many cases achieve the impossible. Nick, it's uh, as you can tell, Marcelo and I can go for another probably the rest of the day, but uh, I want to be mindful of the time. You probably have some questions from the audience as well, and at and, and the end, we'll ask Marcelo if we need closing inspirational comments for the entrepreneurs. But um, to you, Nick, it's up. Thank you, Mai. I believe that everyone enjoyed this discussion as I did. Uh, so I would ask uh, two short questions because we are running out of time. Uh, the first question from the audience uh, says, blockchain and AI are developing fast and will make even bigger gap between people who use and do not use internet. What can be done to reduce this gap in the future? And second one is more general one. Uh, it is about uh, what would be the main message of Marcelo to a government of a small country? Like how can we achieve uh, fast progress? The third one is related to message to entrepreneurs, but you would already, you plan to ask that, Mike. Thank you. So, <laughs> you know, today you sit in a privileged position, whether you, whether you like it or not, you know, today you're a highly penetrated internet country. You know, 80% of people, 76% of people have access to the internet. In most developing nations, that's not the case. I mean, when I go to certain Latin American countries, I mean, they're still on 2G or they're still in 3G and communications are terrible. So today you do that. I love blockchain because blockchain is open for everybody, right? So, you know, you can be an AI, you can be a developer of blockchain or crypto or Bitcoin or Ethereum, and you can develop applications that will sit on top of that to disrupt. And you know, some of the leading crypto companies are not sitting in Silicon Valley. You know, sitting in Argentina, they're sitting in Brazil, they're sitting in uh, in some Baltic countries. So I think I think this allows a whole new wave of disruption that you don't need to be sitting anywhere else. You can basically do it by putting together a good group of people and that allows you to become a global company without any limitations or, or without any borders. So I think that will open a whole new a potential way of disruption that will open you know, opportunities for entrepreneurs all over the world, regardless whether you're in a developed nation or an underdeveloped nation. So that's a good opportunity. You know, the message, what, what, what can I tell government? I always tell government the same, and that is you should never fight the trends, right? Today, we live in a world where there's going to be more disruption than ever. There's going to be more revolution through the air revolution or the blockchain revolution. So you need to adopt it and not fight it. I will give you an example. You know, there's some bold leaders. A tiny country like El Salvador became the first country to legalize Bitcoin as a currency. And it was very simple. It was an easy decision. They say most of the economy of El Salvador comes from Americans, from Salvadorians who live outside El Salvador who want to send money. But we have a little problem. In the middle, you know, if I'm, if I'm in the U.S. and I send money to somebody in El Salvador, it takes 48 hours, and 
only 90 out of the 100 you send get there. With Bitcoin, <laughs> they get it in less than a second and they get the exact amount of value. So this became the country the world was, was like, oh my God, what is this guy doing? And look at that. Now there's so many different countries that are looking at the adoption of a digital currency as a means to, trans to transact. Right, El Salvador is, is a tiny country, and they basically they had they had a leader who what, took a bold position, says I'm going to be the first country mm. to make Bitcoin a legal currency in my country. A small, tiny country, Uruguay. You know, one of my things that I'm most proud is I'm one, I, was, I was one of the founders of a crazy initiative called One Laptop Per Child. Yeah. Now, we believe we wanted to provide one <laughs> computer to every yeah. children because the internet with again Nicholas with Nicolas Negroponte yeah that's right so it was a tiny country the government of Uruguay that said I'm going to buy a computer I'm talking this is like 15 years ago I'm going to be the first country in the world to buy a computer for each of my kids right and back then that was a very very bold move and provide internet connectivity to all my kids and force teachers to change the way they teach and all that it's a tiny country you know I visited the country of Gibraltar even smaller than Macedonia. Yep. And it is the number one country to have properly regulated crypto. So you have all of the big banks in the world now setting up you know, a lot of their people in Gibraltar. In, in Gibraltar. So each country needs to choose a competitive advantage. What are we good at? What do we have that's different than the rest of the world? And what big, bold move you know, we're willing to make? And I love that. I love that because smaller countries can be more agile. Smaller countries, I mean, I only think you know, we live in a country in the U.S. where nothing can get done because it's a polarized country with two political parties that they care more about each other than the well-being of their country, and nothing can get done. In a smaller country, it's like a small entrepreneur. You have a smaller group of people, meaning you can take action a lot faster. So there's, there's no excuses for being a small country and not punching above your weight. Hey, Marcel, I mean, I think you'd be very pleased to hear, and for the audience as well, I mean, a couple of things. When I was at Motorola, actually, we invested in, in our old WiMAX system. Yeah. So Macedonia actually was the first country in Europe back 20 years ago to have a completely wireless across the country. Uh, one of the previous um, governments also bought a computer for most of the kids yeah. in the country, so f yeah. following some of those rules. And uh, uh, as Nikita spoke in Macedonia before we joined, I mean, we prepared a platform for more prosperous future. And Macedonia also has a very strong political parties, and sometimes we argue they worry more about beating the other yeah. as opposed to putting the country first. But that's normal. Right, but, but, but that's what really we're trying to, we, we are trying to be that uh, not-for-profit organization that can be influential yeah. to really encourage people to think yeah. uh, country first. And I think both of us agree that having healthy, well-run businesses with high values is probably among the best assets that yeah. any country can have. Yeah. And I always encourage people, what are left or the right? I mean, we use the line, doesn't matter if, if, if you're left or right, are we focusing on a country moving uh, forward or backwards? Yeah. Now, let me, give you, let me give you a clear example of something that I would do, right, that's practical. If you know that the future of the world is going to be driven by AI, and you know that the future of finance are going to be disrupted by blockchain and crypto, if I'm the president of a country, I would change education to make sure that since the early stage, we start teaching our kids what's artificial intelligence and what's crypto, and we embed it in the education at the earlier stages so when our kids grow up, they're ready to fight in the world. And traditional developing countries were always late were followers, yeah. right? So if I were the president of Macedonia, <laughs> to be precise, yeah. I would make sure that every single one of our kids are learning about AI and learning about blockchain. So that way we're giving them the opportunity to play in the world of what the future is gonna be. Here we go, Nick, it's up. Thank you, thank you, Marcelo. Thank you, Mike, for this wonderful discussion, inspiring. <laughs> thank you. Marcello, it will be a pleasure to have you or host you in Macedonia anytime, but especially for the forthcoming summit in May. <laughs> <laughs> this is official invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank have you. a great day. Bye. You too. Thank you.